Welcome to lecture 15, 2.3 Functions and Relations. So for the first objective, we're going to determine whether a relation is a function. All right, so first off though, what is a relation? It's just a way things relate to one another, hence the name relation. Okay, so we might be talking about numbers that we're talking about that are related to one another or different things like that. In the world, many quantities are related to other variables and may change due to the relationship. For some examples, the cost of mailing a package is related to the weight of a package. Or the test scores a student earns is related to the amount of hours of study. The weight of a person is related to how much the person eats or maybe works out. And the amount of money a person earns is related to how much the person works. Okay, so these are ways that two different variables can be related. For example, the cost and the weight. Those are two different variables. Or a test score and the amount of hours of study. Two ways to relate two different variables. So in math, most common relation is a set of ordered pairs x and y, so two variables. And this is called a relation x and y. So the set of y values in the ordered pair is called the domain of the relation. And the set of y values in the ordered pairs is called the range of the relation. Now, you may or may not remember, but for the Cartesian coordinate plane where you graph things, we have an x value and a y value. These are all our x values, and the y's are all those values. So the domain, the way you think of domain is normally when you're talking about like the domain of someone's kingdom or a dog's domain or something. That's flat ground. So that's the horizontal. And then range, think of a shooting range. That's things when you're shooting into the air. So that'd be the y, val the y values. They're sort of the upward values. That's how I remember the difference between domain and range and which variable it sticks with. If you have other ways to memorize things, go ahead. As long as they work. Alright, so for example one, Write a relation from the following set of tables, or the following table of values. So we're going to go ahead and do an ordered pair. Let's see, our relation. So we have the x values and the y values. We're going to write them as ordered pairs. So 3 is paired up with the 56. Then the 11 is paired up with the 99. Go ahead and see if you can fill out the other two. All right, so the next one is 5 and 73, and then 8 and 86. Now, for fun, let's do the domain and the range. Well, remember the domain of the x values, so we'll just go ahead and list those out. 3, 11, 5, and 8. Those are the values we use for x. Now the range, let's see what do we use for the range. Those four values. 56, 99, 73, and 86. Now, what is the definition of a function? So, one thing to note is that a function is a very special relation that we look at in mathematics. There are lots of different relations, but ones mathematicians tend to focus on are the ones that are called functions. So, given a relation in x and y, we say that y is a function of x If for each value of x in the domain, there's exactly one value of y in the range. Very important. So every x has one y, not the other way around. So keep that in mind. And if this happens, we call it a function. So for example two, we're going to determine if the following relations are functions. And how will we do that? Well, I want to try and see if it fits this definition. And the definition says each x has only one y. So I'm going to put these out in tables to see if I can find an x that has more than one y. So the first one, I have 3, 1. 3, 1. The next one, I have 2, 5. I don't see another 2 for x, so I'll go ahead and write that down. 5. Then I see negative 3, 0. Okay, negative 3, 0. Lastly, I see 2, 6. Oh, we already had a 2 for x. 
So this is saying that there's another y value for x equal to 2. So notice, for this x, there are two values of y, which does not fit the definition. The definition said there should only be one value for y. And in this relation, it has two. So this relation is not a function. Shucks. Okay, let's go ahead and check the other one. Actually, pause the video and try to check this one by yourself. See what you find out. All right, so the first one we have 0, 4. Then the next ordered pair, we have 5, negative 3. Then we have 3, 4. Then 6, 5. And a negative 1, negative 4. Well, each of our x values have exactly one y value, so we're good. So now one of you might have noticed that y appears twice. And you might say, wait, does this make it not a function? And the answer is no. We only care that x has one y. Okay. So since each value of x has exactly one y value attached to it, we're good. So this relation is a function. And if you were asked why, you would just state each x value has one y value. That would be your reason. So now, moving on. There are some other ways to check that a function, or that a graph, or a relation is a function. Because sometimes, there are so many points, it would be really tedious to sit there and write all of them out in a chart. Like, if you had, for example, a thousand points, you would not want to try to check that by hand. So another thing you can do is something called the vertical line test. And this works best if you're looking at graphs. Okay, doesn't really work well for a table. So consider a relation defined by a set of points x, y graphed on a rectangular coordinate system. The graph defines y as a function of x if no vertical line intersects the graph in more than one point. Okay, so I get the idea we're using a vertical line and we're checking to make sure it doesn't intersect. What does intersect mean? That means cross. So we want to make sure it doesn't cross our graph in more than one point. All right, let's just take a look at what these are. So we're going to apply the vertical line test to the following graphs to determine if the relationship defines y as a function of x. So I'm going to go ahead and drop a vertical line to test this out. So my first graph. Um, I dropped a vertical line. And it doesn't intersect my graph in more than one place, but is this line useful that I just dropped? That line is really not useful. Why? Well, it's not touching my graph, so it's not helping me in any way. So let's drop the line where it's more useful. How about here? Boop. Where does it touch my graph? In one point. Does it pass the test? Well, yeah, it does in that one area, because it only hits once. How about if I drop another line? That one also passes. Or another line? That one passes. In fact, however many lines I drop that are vertical, they'll all pass, because they'll all only hit in one place. So what I see is by the VLT, we can abbreviate vertical line test with a VLT. It is a function. Huzzah. All right. Now take a look at B and try to drop a vertical line yourself and see what you get. Well, once again, I could drop a line there, but that's not helpful at all. How about if I drop a line here? <gasps> look at that. I pass, or I intersect there and there. I intersect my graph in two points. I said it could only intersect once, turn the definition. So, this is actually not a function, but somebody might say, hey, wait, if I drop a line right there, it'll hit perfectly at the vertex of this parabola. And it only hits once. That makes it a function, right? The answer would be no. Because even though it works here, it doesn't work on the rest of the graph. So it actually is not a function. So I'd say, by the VLT, oops, wrong pen. 
by the VLT. It is not a function. All right, let's take a look at the last one. Dropping a vertical line. Oh, all good there. All good there. All good there. All good there. In fact, even as it gets steeper and steeper, it still will work. So this is going to be by the VLT. It is a function. All right. So that's a great way to check to see if your relation is a function is using the vertical line test. Super easy. But it pretty much only works with a graph. So now let's take a look at applying function notation. All right, so mathematicians figured out a way to let other mathematicians know when an equation was a function without having to always tell them that it's a function. For example, if you saw this, looks like a normal equation, how would you know it was a function? How could I tell you it's a function? Well, a solution is to just give it a function notation. So what mathematicians did is they said, you know what, for all functions, by the way, take away y and replace it with f of x. This will let other mathematicians know that this equation is a function. So if it used to be y equals 2x plus 3, what I would do to let you know this is a function is I'd take away that y and I'd write f of x equals 2x plus 3. So then you don't have to ask me, hey, is this a function? You can just say, oh, I know it's a function, because she called it a function right there with f of x. So notice, this is not f times x. This is f of x, function notation. So once again, note, y has a new nickname now. We can also call y by f of x. Same thing. OK, so that was my brief intro there. Let's go ahead and use this notation. So we're given the following no function, f of x equal to 2x plus 3. And we're told to evaluate the following. And note that in function notation, f of x is used in place of y. OK, so what does this mean, f of 2? Well, this is saying wherever you see x, because remember, that's normally where x is, where that 2 is, you're going to replace it with a 2. So replace x with 2. All right, let's take a look at our original equation. We had f of x equals 2x plus 3. And now we're told to find f of 2. OK, so in the former equation, where do you see x? Right there. So I'm going to replace that with 2. So that'll be 2 times x, which is now 2, plus 3. Simplifying that, I get f of 2 equals 4 plus 3. So f of 2 equals 7. And I'm done. OK, so this next one, what are we being asked to do? We're being told to replace x with negative 1. All right, so f of, and we want negative 1. It's going to be equal to 2 times, and remember, we're replacing the x with a negative 1, plus 3. So f of negative 1 equals negative 2 plus 3. f of negative 1 equals 1. OK, go ahead and try the other two by yourself and check back in with me in a second. OK, so the next one is saying we're going to replace x with 0. All right, so we have f of 0 this time equals 2 times 0 plus 3. So f of 0 is going to be 0 plus 3, which means f of 0 is 3. And the last one, ooh, a fraction. So we're replacing x with a fourth. So f of a fourth is going to equal 2 times a fourth plus 3. So f of a fourth, oops, 
Two hundred equal. Okay, well that can cancel into a half plus two. Oh, oh plus three. Sorry. To add these fractions, we've got to do the building up property. So multiply by two, multiply by two. Then f of a fourth is going to equal a half plus six over two, which will be seven over two. So f of a fourth is seven over two. Okay, not too bad. Now let's take a look at example five. Evaluate the following functions. k of x equals one over x, and h of x equals x two x squared plus x with the given values. All right, so we're given two separate functions this time. We have k of x, so a new name. And don't worry, even though it doesn't say f of x, this is so we don't get them all confused, because if every function was called f of x, it would just be like if everyone in the world was called Bob. You'd never know which Bob I was talking about. So that's why we have different names for people. Some people are Jill, some are Keave, some are Keiko, some are Tiffany. It's so we can tell them apart. So that's why we use that here with functions. We have two new functions, and their names are k of x, and the other one's name is h of x equals 2x squared plus x. All right, so this first one says, take a look at k, and in place of x, use an a. Well, that's weird. We were only using numbers before. But we can still do this. We're just going to replace x with a. All right, let's go ahead and write this down. So k of x was originally 1 over x, and we're told to replace x with a. So wherever I see x in the equation, I'll replace it with a. So k of a is going to be equal to 1 over a. And we can't simplify that because I don't know what a is. In fact, a looks like a 9, so I'll change that. All right. And there we go. Now let's take a look at b. Ooh, that's weird. What's going on on the inside there? We have an addition problem going on inside. But that's all right. Once again, we can use the same concept. So we're taking x plus h in replace of x. Now I might say, wait, but we already have an x. But don't worry, this is a different value. x plus h is different than x. So we're going to replace x plus, or sorry, we're going to replace x with x plus h. So wherever we see x in our formula, or our equation function, we're going to replace it with x plus h. So where do we see x? I see x. Remember, we're replacing it. I see it here and here, two places this time. Wow, we haven't seen that before. So h of x plus h is going to be, so we'll take 2, and then we're replacing x with x plus h. Ooh, and then we square it. And then we're adding on to it one more of the new value, which is x plus h. So if I simplify that, I have h of x plus h equals 2 times x plus h squared plus x plus h. And we could go ahead and simplify that out a bit. h of x plus h is going to be, let's simplify this out. So that's going to be 2 times x plus h times x plus h plus x plus h, which is going to be 2x squared plus 4xh plus h squared plus x plus h. Oops, almost. That should be a 2h squared. Skipped a few steps there. All right. So if you weren't certain what I skipped there, what I did on the side here was I had x plus h times x plus h times the 2. That would be x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. And then I fo factor in the 2. Sorry, I distribute in the 2. And I get what I wrote down earlier. OK, so my side work there. Oops, the eraser was a bit too large. All right. All right, can we add any like terms? Nope, that's it. Now we can box our answer. So some of you might say, well, couldn't we have just stopped over here? 
And the answer is, unless I tell you a specific form, either one of these would have worked fine. All right, now let's take a look at k of 0. Go ahead, try to figure this one out by yourself. Check in with me in a second. Well, this is saying we're going to replace x with 0. So that means k of 0 is going to be 1 over 0. Oh my goodness, what did I just do? I tried to divide something by 0. <gasps> that is no can do. It's undefined. So this is going to be undefined. You cannot divide something by 0. All right, so functions can be undefined. Now let's take a look at the next objective, which is determining the x and y intercepts of a function, defined by y equals f of x. So we've looked at x and y intercepts before, and the idea is pretty much the same as it was before. To find the x-intercept, set y to 0. And for the y-intercept, set x equal to 0. Same idea. All right. So we are given this equation, or function. How do I know this is a function? Well, they called it f of x. I know it's a function. And we're told to find x and y intercepts. So let me set up for that. So for the x-intercepts, I know that y is going to be 0. And then for the y-intercepts, I know that x is going to be 0. So I'll set it up for that, and then I'll go ahead to solve. So for x-intercept, we're setting y equal to 0. But in my equation, I don't see a y. Oh gosh, what do I do? Well, remember, f of x is just the nickname for y, isn't it? So I'll go ahead and change that out and replace it with y so it looks a little more similar. So y equals x squared, oh, x minus 1 squared, minus 4. And we're going to take out y, replace it with 0, because that's how we find our x-intercepts. So 0 equals x minus 1 squared minus 4. How do we solve this? Uh, we can do the square root property. So add 4 to both sides, so we get 4 equals x minus 1 squared. Then we can square root both sides. And then we have, let me swap this around, x minus 1 equals plus or minus 2. So then x is going to equal 1 plus or minus 2 which, when we split the work, x equals 1 plus 2, x equals 1 minus 2. Then x finally equals negative 1, and x equals 3. But we're not going to leave this as this, because remember, we're looking for a coordinate set. For our intercepts, we always write it as a coordinate set. What do we do? We write our intercepts as a coordinate set. All right, so we have negative 1, 0, and we actually have 2. Exciting. It's like twins. And, oops, that's just a 3, 0. Not a 2, it's a 3. And there we go, our two x-intercepts. Now let's look at the y-intercept. Well, how do we find y-intercepts? We set x to 0. So we're going to take out that little 1, replace it with 0. Wherever we see x, we'll replace it with 0. So f of 0 is going to be 0 minus 1 squared minus 4. Then f of 0 is um, negative 1 squared minus 4. Let's see, 1 minus 4, so f of 0 is going to be negative 3. And remember, f is just another name for y, so this is saying that y equals negative 3. So there we go. Our y intercept. 0, negative 3. Now let's take a look at objective 4. Determine the domain and range of a function. Once again, these are talking about the allowable values. The domain was for x values. Range was for our y values. So the domain is the set of x values in the function. And the range is the set of y values in the function. For example, 7, determine the domain and the range of each function and write them in interval notation. So we have a function given over here. 
Um, how do I know it's a function? Well, if I was to draw a vertical line through it, should never pass through it more than once. Yeah, and it passes the vertical line test, so we're good. But we already told it was a function, so we don't really need to check that. Well, the domain, all the x values I use. Let's see. Well, now these are all just points. So I can list them out. That'll be easy. Let's see, I use negative 5. Well, there's no interval here, actually, for domain and range, so I can't write it in an interval. But I can just list out each number. So negative 5, that looks like negative 4. And then the next one looks like negative 2. And then this looks like 1. That is 5. And that is 6, 7, 8. All right, so I've listed out my x values for the domain. Now let's do the same for my range. My range is looking at the y values. So the range, let's take a look. I'll start from bottom and go to top. First one I see here is negative 4. And then, let's see, uh, my range I hit 0. And then next ones I hit 5. Range is kind of weird because you're looking sort of sideways at it. And lastly, I hit 9. So my range values are just four of them. Okay, now let's take a look at the next function. This one's different than our graph in blue because I don't think I want to try and list out each x value. I mean, I know that that is negative 1 and that is 1. Or sorry, that's negative 2 and that's negative 1. But what about all the numbers in between? How do I list those out? I know negative half is in there, and negative fourth, and negative eighth, and negative sixteenth, and negative... I could keep going on forever. Finding all the little itty bitty values inside there. And that was supposed to be a shocked face, but it ended up looking like a three. This is a shocked face trying to find out all the little values inside there. We're not going to do that. We're not going to list them out. There are way too many numbers just inside this weensy little interval. Imagine trying to write out all the numbers in that interval. It's not possible. So what do you do when it's not possible to write them all out? You just list an interval. So let's do an interval. I use all the x values from almost 5. I don't include it. And I go up until... Ooh, what does that arrowhead mean? That means it goes on to infinity. So my domain is from negative 5 not including until infinity. Now what's my range? Those are the y values. Well my lowest y value that I see, always start at your lowest one, is right here and that looks like a negative 5. But we don't include it. And then going up, let's see how high up do we go? Once again, infinity. So negative 5 to infinity again. Kinda weird. Okay, but notice if you don't want to spend your time listing out every single point, because it's actually impossible to do that for this graph, interval notation is the way to go. Okay, go ahead and try the next problem by yourself. Check in with me in a second. All right, domain. Those are going to be my x values. Um, what is my smallest x value? I don't have one. That arrow indicates infinity. So negative infinity up until, beep, 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 ooh, another arrowhead, positive infinity. Lots of infinities going around. Next, let's take a look at the range. Smallest value we start at is right here at negative 4, and we include it. And then we go up until, oh goodness, look at those arrowheads. That's infinity. Positive infinity. Okay, not too bad on that. Now let's take a look at determining. All right, example eight. Determine the domain of the following functions. Answer in interval notation. Sometimes hard to get this straight. All right. 
Okay, so determining the domain. Hmm, what does that mean? Well, the domain would be the values we can use, or another way to think of the domain is the allowable x values. So allowable x values. What does that mean? Well, let's just take a look, for example, at this function. Can you think of a number that x shouldn't be allowed to be? How about 0? Can x be 0? Well, if x was 0, we would get 1 over 0, which is undefined. That's a problem. So x should not equal 0. x can be any other number on the number line, except for the problem number of 0. We'll just take that little guy out who's causing the problem, and we're good. So the domain would be every number except 0. Let's think of another kind of function that could have a problem. How about f of x equal to the square root of x? Can you think of any number that shouldn't be under a radical? Well, how about negative 1? Should we have negative 1? No, because that's an imaginary number. In fact, x should always be a positive number, which means that x should always be greater than or equal to 0. Okay, so that brings the main sort of concepts into focus for this section. If you ever see a fraction, what you want to do is you want to check what values make your denominator equal to 0, then take those problem values out. If you ever see a, a radical, you always want to make sure that what's under the radical is positive. So you want to check what makes it negative and take those values out. Okay, it's just taking out the problem numbers. So what we're going to do is we're going to check. So I'm going to see what makes this equal to 0. Another way you could say is x squared minus 2 cannot equal 0. Now we're going to solve for x. So solving for x, why are we solving for x? Because we want to find the problem numbers. That's what we're doing. Okay, so then x squared cannot equal 2. Solving for x, square root both sides. Remember, we needed it to plus or minus. Then x cannot equal plus or minus the root of 2. But x can be any other number. Okay, so let's go ahead, answer an interval notation. So let's graph this to see. What we know is that x can be any number except for plus or minus root 2. We're going to take those out of the number line, and any other number works just fine. Well, translating this into interval notation, that is going to be, starting at negative infinity, we go up to negative root 2. We can't include it. Now we're going to union to start again at this inside area. That's negative root 2 up until root 2. Pause again. Take out positive root 2. Then we'll continue again after root 2 on to positive infinity. Whew, that's a big one. And that's our answer in interval notation for the domain. So for fractions, what we do is we make sure we take out the items that make the denominator 0. Now for radicals, we want to check what makes the inside negative. So we're going to check. We know that x minus 5 cannot be less than 0. It should be a positive number, so we know it cannot be less than 0. So let's solve for those values. Add 5 to both sides. So x cannot be less than 5. Let's go ahead and graph these values. So 5, x cannot be less than 5, which means that the only option is for x to be greater than 5. Can it be equal to 5? Yeah. It just can't be less than. All right, so my interval notation is 5 to infinity. And you could always check that. Pick a random number. How about 5? If I plug 5 in to this, I'll get root 5 minus 5, which is going to equal root 0. And the square root of 0 is 0. We have no problem. You could always pick a number from the problem area, which would be maybe a negative, let's say negative 4. If I plug that into my equation, I get the square root of negative 4 minus 5, which is the square root of negative 9.
an imaginary number, which we can't have. Okay, yep, it looks like from some small testing, it checked out. So that is our answer. So now the next problem, there is a small typo here. That should be x squared. Take out that other x. Now, as usual, it's a fraction. So what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to check what makes the denominator 0 and take that out. So I know that x squared plus 2 cannot equal 0. So let's solve for x. Minus 2 from both sides. Square root both sides. Oh, look at this. I have an imaginary number going on. There's a negative under that radical. I can't find a real number. There's no real solution. What does that mean for us? Well, let's just take a look at this another way. x squared plus 2. No matter what value you throw into x squared, whether it's a negative or a positive, it'll always end up being a positive, so there's no way to cancel out that 2. And even if you threw in 0 there, it would be 0 plus 2. There is no way to get 0 in this problem. So what does that mean for us? What is the domain for this problem? Well, the domain is going to be negative infinity to positive infinity. Oh, and I forgot. We're supposed to write dome for domain, or Okay, so it's going to be dome of, oh sorry, let me get my pen back out. Domain of k is all real numbers. Now, let me go back and change, make sure to put these in here. I need to make sure to label this. This is going to be domain of, and we had function g. So dome of g. That's an ugly box. Not quite as pretty, not quite as ugly. All right, and lastly, this was f. So dome f. Dome of f, I'm running out of room a little bit here. OK. All right, so make sure to put in those domains to label your functions. Now last, we're going to look at interpreting a function graphically. All right, so for example 9, use the function in the graph to provide, provided to answer the following questions. So part A, determine f of 5. What is this saying? This is saying, when x is 5, what is my y value? Well, let's look. When x is 5, that's here. Where does my highlight line cross our graph? It crosses it right here at this point. And that point is x, our y value of 1, 2, 3. So, when x is 5, y is 3. Next is to determine let's see, determine f of negative 5. Okay, so now what we're looking at is the other version, negative 5. Where does it cross my axis? Or not my axis, sorry. Where does it cross with the y values? Right here, well, goodness. That value doesn't exist for y. Darn. So f of negative 5 does not exist. And we'd write does not exist. OK, well, that didn't work. How about f of negative 3? Well, where is that? Negative 3. Um, hmm. 1, 2, 3, right here. Oops, wrong pen. All right, where does it cross for the y values? The y values have been right here at this point, so that is 1, 2, 3. So that's going to be negative 3, 3. Once again, it's asking for the y value when x is negative 3. Now, next we're looking at determine 
all x for which f of x is 0. What is this saying? So we're going to look at where f of x is 0. And what is that saying? That is saying where y is 0. So look at where y equals 0 and find the x values. Well, where does y equal 0? Let's highlight that. y is 0 along this. And there's only one point. Boop, right there. So what is the x value for that? Well, it's not a perfect value, but I'm going to estimate it to be 1, 2, 3. Negative 3.5. Why not? About negative 3.5, 0. If you're not certain, you can always use that little piece there, about. Now let's take a look at E. Similar problem. Find all x for which f of x is 3. Go ahead, pause the video so you can figure this one out. Okay, f of x is 3. So we're looking for when y is 3. When y is 3. And when is y 3? Along here. Oh, there's a bunch of times when x is going on there. So y is 3 for all of these values in this interval here. Um, is it possible to list out all those x values? No, it's not. So I can't list them out, but I can write the answer for that in interval notation. I know it starts here at 1, 2, 3, negative 3, and it goes on to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, positive 5. So, including negative 3 up until 5. For all of these x values, the y is 3. Now, next problem. Determine the x-intercept. Well, remember the x-intercept is when y is 0. And when is y 0? Right here. Oh, well, we already did that answer right there. My x-intercept is negative 3.5. And I would say about negative 3.5 comma 0. Try and find the y-intercept. Well, the y-intercept is where my graph crosses the y-axis, which is right there. And that value is 1, 2, 3. So the y-intercept is 0, 3. And lastly, or not lastly, almost lastly, determine the domain. So remember, the domain are my x values. So we're just going to be looking this way. So my x values start here at negative 5, but they don't include negative 5. And then they go until, look at that, that's positive infinity. So they go until positive infinity. Negative 5 to positive infinity. Now let's look at the range. Well, range, remember we're talking about vertical values, starting at the lowest y value I see, which is right here at negative 5, and I go on until, ooh, look at that arrowhead, that implies infinity. So infinity, negative 5 till infinity. Once again, these two are sim the same. That doesn't always happen, but in this problem, the domain and range were the same values. All right, and that is it for this section. Please email me if you have any questions about the homework.